Today we're going to talk about the marathon mind. Living a life for God is hard. It's hard. It's trials, it's sacrifice, it's going beyond your comfort zone, it's doing things that you don't want to do. And sometimes, let's just be honest, it feels like it's too much. Like God is asking for too much, that he wants me to sacrifice too much. And we get tired, and we get burnt out on church, and we get burnt out on Jesus. I've been there. It happens. This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I was supposed to do, God. This is a bit too much for me. And do you know why we think like that? Because we've subscribed to the idea that walking with God, giving your life over to God, having a life where Jesus leads your life, however you want to say it, that it was supposed to be easy. We don't want to admit that, but we do. We think, okay, God, we know you're going to give us one or two tests because then, you know, then you'll have a testimony. We'll sprinkle those in here and there. But for the most part, I mean, you need to be happy that I decided to give you my life, and so I kind of think things should be pretty easy. I don't understand what the problem is. And then I'm going to get to go to heaven, and then we're going to party. That's what we think, and because we feel betrayed the second something happens to us. God, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? What's going on here? We also seem to have this sprinter's mentality. Now, I used to be a, a runner, and, and sprinters, we like to go fast. We like to do things fast. We like to get to the finish line fast. And so, God, take care of this now. I want it right now. Let's do it right now. Fix it right now. Change it right now. Here's the problem, though. Sprinting doesn't last. You can't sprint for a long period of time. And this isn't the first time that this type of issue has come up. You see, in the book of Hebrews, we had two different groups of people evaluating Jesus. We had those that were used to tradition. They were used to the way things were, and so they were trying to evaluate what his angle was. And then you had another group that was struggling with their new faith. They were struggling with, with they, if they, do they really, really want to follow Christ? Kind of sounds like today. But one thing both groups had in common is this thing I like to call hybrid faith. So I went and I researched hybrid cars, and I found out that hybrid cars do not run on a single energy source, but on a combination of a fuel engine and a battery. The car does not run with the two energy sources getting merged together. Rather, they are used alternately instead based on the level of energy needed to navigate the terrain. Okay, so... It's a tough terrain, it's a difficult terrain, we're gonna use the fuel engine, okay? And then it gets a little bit easier, we're gonna switch over to the battery. God, this is really hard, I can't do this, I got faith in you right now, so fix it. So handle it, so take care of it, God. But now that it's gotten a little bit easy, road's a little bit clear, I got this. I'm good, Jesus, you can take a break. Hybrid faith. The problem with hybrid faith and the problem with the sprinter's, menta sprinter's mentality is that it's not sustainable. You can't have a sustainable life for God, sprinting all the time, because we're, we're not supposed to sprint for long periods of time. And you can't use your own energy source because you will not be able to handle it. So how do we develop a mind that is going to have a sustainable, that will be sustainable to live this life for Christ? How do we develop a marathon mind? Well, I did a little research, and I found out that marathon runners, number one, they aren't scared to run. That's number one. See, verse 12 says, let's see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns you away from a living God. So when most people think of running a marathon, if you ask them to run a marathon, their answer would be, no, Just, no, I'm not going to do that. I like my workout routine. I like what I do. I'm comfortable with where I am. I don't want to stretch and try something new. That just looks like it's going to be hard. See, too often the struggle to really commit to anything new is our comfort with the familiar. We like what we like, we like our routines, our traditions, and this is good for me. I'll just stay right here. And the same happens with committing to God. We're worried that if we really commit to him, that we really run his race, he's gonna change us. He's gonna change who we are, he's gonna change our identity, he's gonna change how we act, he's gonna change how we think, and he's not. He made us. Why would he change us? He's not gonna change who we are, just what we run for. See, too often our traditions and our routines become our identity. So during this time in scripture, Judaism was the religion of the time. It was symbolic of the Old Testament. Divinely designed, it was the best religion expressing true worship and devotion to God. You had the commandments, the rituals, the prophets, sharing God's promises, but then Christ came. 
fulfilling the law, conquering sin, and shattering all barriers to God, freely offering eternal life. But like us, you had the group of people that weren't interested in the upgrade. They weren't interested in a life of grace and mercy. Jesus was offering the new iPhone, and they were like, nah, I'm going to go ahead and stick this whole rotary phone thing out. I'm good. Like, you have the i4. That's great. I'm going to stick to the rotary. I'll be okay. See, their religious motives were, their religious motives was rituals, not relationships. So with this group, you're like, I don't want to run a new race. I'm used to the way things are. I'm used to how church is done. I'm used to how we handle things. I don't want to do anything new because this makes sense. This works for me. And I'm sorry if it ain't broke. I'm just saying. And then we have this other group, the ones similar to the Israelites in the wilderness whose hearts had become hardened because in their mind, God had left. Based on their circumstances, he was nowhere to be found and their hearts hardened to the very idea that God could deliver them. And that's where some of you are today. You can't even imagine running a race for God right now with everything going on in your life. And I get that. I've been there too. But what you have to constantly be reminded of and what I want to share with you is that he's still with us. This struggle that makes it hard to see him, the struggle that just makes things seem impossible, is just part of our training. And muscles you didn't know you had, you're strengthening. That's why it hurts. But you know something both of these groups had in common? It's fear. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of things we don't want to do is because of fear. We're scared we won't be good at it. We're scared we won't be competent enough. And if I was wrong about this, what else could I possibly be wrong about? But I'm here to tell you that if you weren't qualified to run God's race or have the potential to be good, Jesus wouldn't be recruiting you. And you might not feel like you're being recruited right now because you're thinking there's a lot of stuff wrong with me. I am not, you know, potential athlete candidate right now. Well, let me show you how you are. Matthew 9, 12 through 13 says, On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He sees something in you. Even if you don't believe in yourself, he believes in you. Second thing I noticed that marathon runners do is they train with a team. Verse 13 says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If we are going to complete this race, we need teammates. We cannot do this in isolation. When I was running track, I would, we would finish a workout and I would just, I would be tired. I'd be Leg, hands on my head, just bent over, want some water, body hurts, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe track is not for me. Maybe that's not my thing. And then my coach is over here screaming, you can do it. You got another one. You got five more. I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. You, can't, you clearly don't see what I look like right now. You don't understand what I'm going through. But if I look to the left and I look to the right and I see my teammates and they're doing the same thing I'm doing, they're struggling just as hard as I'm struggling, then I realize, you know what, it's not just me. I'm not the only one struggling with this. And you know what? Maybe I am qualified to run this. Maybe I am qualified to be on this team. And the same thing happens in a relationship with God. You cannot do this by yourself. Because you start to think that the issues that you deal with, the sins that you have, the problems that you have are specific to you. And I guarantee you, they're not. You get in isolation and Satan makes you think that you're the only one going through what you're going through. But when you get into community, you see, oh, I'm not the only one struggling with this. This is not uncommon as I thought it was. In fact, I actually can get over it because you're getting over it. Or at least you're acknowledging that it's an issue and maybe we can get over it together. See, authentic relationships allow you to have conversations with your teammates. You can say things like, when you struggle with this, what scripture did you refer to? When you didn't have it in you to pray anymore, what did you do? When you question if God even existed, how do you handle that? But you can't do that by yourself because you can't answer your own question. See, and this isn't an every blue moon kind of thing. The scripture says daily, and so we need people to walk with us, teammates to encourage us daily. Something teammates also do is they help shield some of the adversity. We have this term in track called drafting. And what drafting is, you have a group of runners together. 
You have a couple in the front, one or two in the front, and then you have everyone else behind them. And what happens is the first person or the first two people in the front are taking on all of the wind resistance. They're taking on all of the adversity. They're taking on all of the issues. And so when it gets to the, the wind comes to the people behind them, they really don't feel anything. And they really get to, get to just focus on training. They get to just focus on running. So the person in the front, not only are they the strongest, they're now being able to be strengthened more because the adversity is coming at them and they're having to deal with it. The person behind them doesn't have to deal with as much adversity because the person in front of them is taking care of it. So they get to work on growing and strengthening themselves and training. And so when the person up front gets tired because they've done all they can do, they just move to the back of the line and the person on the second comes forward and now they're in the lead. See, it's much easier to make progress when runners take turns pulling each other. They can run a lot farther and they can run a lot faster than they ever could alone. So what does drafting look like? I'm glad y'all asked. Drafting looks like, I love our media team. Drafting looks like praying for someone else, encouraging others, listening, helping, correcting, in love. Everyone together in love. Okay. So you might be saying, okay, that's cute. Clap, clap, drafting, whatever. I don't do that well. I don't like to encourage people. To be honest, I don't like to listen all that much. I'm not really good at praying out loud, and I don't like a lot of folks. So I really don't think I'm qualified for this team. Okay, I'm going to get myself right, and then I'm going to come to Christ. I'm going to work on me, get it right, make a pretty package for him because he doesn't know what I really look like, and then I'm going to come to Christ. Well, let me tell you about some of your teammates, and then you can tell me if you actually qualify for the team. So according to Hebrews 11, some of our teammates include an adulterer, a liar, a whore, a thief, a drunk, a manipulator, a pacifist, a trickster, and let's not forget a murderer that killed thousands of Christians but once converted wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, I think you're in good company. In fact, all the teammates I named ended up in what we like to call the Faith Hall of Fame. And it's not because they were perfect that they made it to the Hall of Fame, it's that they progressed through the pain and they finished. That's it. The definition of a marathon is simply a contest of endurance. That's it. You only have one competitor, too, and that's the enemy. Okay, I'm going to have to say that again. You only have one competitor, one enemy, one hater, one person, one entity that has an issue with you, and that is the entity. I mean, that is the enemy, okay? We have got to stop fighting each other. We have got to stop getting into it with each other because we are not the enemy. And he's making us think that we are. We can't even get to the battleground because we're fighting each other in camp. We have one enemy. And the contest is to endure past him. That's it. So, with our marathon mind, we must remember that with all the wind, all the injuries, all the pain, all the disappointment, that if we just keep enduring, if we just keep faith in the one thing, that Jesus said, victory is ours. So the third thing that marathon runners tend to do is they trust their training. Verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original convictions firmly to the end. Did you know that marathon runners only train for 20 of the 26 miles? A marathon is 26 miles long and they only train for the first 20 miles. The last six are called no man's land. And what you were supposed to do was rely on the training from the first 20 to get you through the last six. The problem is, when it comes to our relationship with God, we get to mile 21 and we forget what God said about us. We forget who God says we are. We forget the promise that God has promised us. We forget who he says we will be. We forget our training. So for those of you who have possibly forgotten your training, or for some who might not know that there was training, let me share a few scriptures with you. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. 
He will never leave you nor forsake you. Romans 8, 21, B. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, then who or what can be against us? 1 John 5, 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Yes, it's hard. This race is hard, but it isn't over. Because when God sees you, he sees victory. When God sees you, he sees victory. And that's why you're on this team. Another thing marathon runners tend to do is they trust their coach. They have to trust, they have to trust that the coach knows what they're talking about. Most great coaches were actually also ex-athletes. It's the same with Jesus. Jesus understands the race we're running because he ran it. So as I said before, part of the problem was that people were questioning the superiority of Christ. They were comparing him to angels and Moses and high priests, and they began to lose faith in who he really was and his qualifications to lead us. Okay? So if we go a chapter before, Hebrews 2.14 says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Okay, so if God's children made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. So he took everything that was divine, all of his divinity, and put it into human form. He put it into flesh and blood because we are flesh and blood. Okay, so he put on our uniform in order to run this race. Okay, so he put on the uniform to figure out what our restrictions would be in this flesh and blood uniform, to figure out what the restraints would be in this flesh and blood uniform, to figure out what some of our hindrances might be in this flesh and blood uniform. He put on the uniform so he would know how we feel when we attempt to run this race. All right, okay, so you ha that's the first thing. Coach put on the uniform for us so we can't complain about the uniform. All right, so you have Hebrews 2.18 then that says, Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Okay, so he has on the uniform, and he's gone through suffering and testing for when we are tested. Okay, so coach has put on the uniform that we're about to wear, so he knows all the issues and the restrictions with the uniform, and then he has actually run the race that we are preparing to run, so he's in the uniform that we are running in, running the race that we have to soon run. He's already built the path for us to run it, so we really don't have much to worry about because coach already knows what we're going through, right? Okay, see, here's the problem, though. Too often, when we think of suffering with Jesus, we think of the cross. And that's right, but it, it, it disconnects us a bit from him. Because I don't know about you, I've never been beat like that on a cross. Never. Or we think of Jesus and we think that he is synonymous with perfection and holiness and never doing anything wrong and never sinning. And I don't know about y'all, but I sin a lot. Some of y'all have been sinning since I've been talking. Y'all laugh way too loud at that. <laughs> it's true. Amen. Thank God for honesty. So here's the problem. We can't really connect with what Jesus has gone through in his experience because we think, well, he's never sinned. He's been tempted, but he's never sinned. And he suffered on a cross, but I don't really relate to that. So I get what you're saying. Okay, he's been through some things, but what does your Jesus know about heartbreak? I lost my mom, I lost my dad, I lost my brother, I lost my sister, I lost my child. What does your Jesus know about your heart breaking into so many pieces when you try to put it back together? There are still voids there, there are still holes there that for whatever reason, after all these years, I still can't feel. What does your Jesus know about heartbreak? What does your Jesus know about fatigue, about being tired, about depression, about anxiety, about laying in my bed and not wanting to get up that day? And honestly, I would really just rather sleep until. What does your Jesus know about betrayal and about being disappointed and about people that you love and you trusted and you just put everything you could into them, turn their back on you like it was nothing? What does your Jesus know about that? What does your Jesus know about isolation and people only wanting to be around you because of what you can do for them? 
people only wanting to be around you because they can get something out of you. If I were to go home and never do another thing for another person, my phone wouldn't ring. I wouldn't talk to anybody. What does your Jesus know about my isolation? What does your perfect Jesus know about my pain? Everything.